the question always gets asked, and it gets asked primarily of us at the port, and it gets asked of the chamber. Why are you guys talking about aerospace so much? What is your fascination with aerospace? And the reason we believe in it, the reason we are so excited about it, and the reason that I'm so excited about our CEO, Roland, is one thing, jobs. We believe, our board believes, that there is no problem in San Antonio or anywhere that can't be fixed by increasing the average wage in this community and providing more employment opportunities. And this is an industry that built San Antonio. Wayne was kind enough, the D. Howard Foundation, to bring the photographs out in the lobby and is continuing to build San Antonio. In preparation for this, I asked our friends at the EDF to tell me what is the average wage for an aerospace employee in San Antonio, the average earnings. And it's $79,000. The state of Georgia actually tracks this information. The state of Texas doesn't. And Georgia says that every aerospace job creates $137,000 of wealth for the state. And there's something even better about it. And I'm looking at folks like JR. And when you get involved in this aerospace industry, you build a skill. And it's a skill set that goes with you for your entire life. So right now, you're managing C-17s. But you've got a skill set, you've got a license, you've got a certification where you control your own destiny. And it's something that promotes educational attainment. It is a fantastic industry. And yes, it's an industry that I love, and I know the chamber makes fun of me for it. <laughs> but I also love alligators, and I'm not up here saying we should base our economy on alligators. But I do suggest if you're free on Sundays at 3 p.m., go to Snake Farm, watch them feed the alligators. <laughs> this is an industry that has tremendous potential for San Antonio. But it's something that we have to keep watching. There are three things, I don't care what the industry is, that drives whether you're going to grow an industry. The first one is the capital challenge, the construction cost challenge. And you look at some of these facilities. Up top, we have part of Port San Antonio. We've got the Boeing facility in Washington. We got, unfortunately, the Airbus facility down there in Brooklyn, Alabama. Funny looking airplanes. Each one of those facilities is tremendously expensive. If we were to try and recreate building 375, the Boeing building today, it would cost about $220 million to build that building. That is about a million square feet under roof. I don't even want to know how much it would cost to build the Everett facility. And we know that in Brooklyn, Alabama, excuse me, in Mobile, Alabama, all in they've spent close to a billion dollars building that facility. You get tired of my slideshow? The second thing is the workforce challenge. When you look for where you're going to do this work, you need to make sure that the people you have available have the skill set to do it. And what Brian was talking about in terms of where the industry is going is actually something that's both an opportunity and a challenge for us. Historically, what San Antonio has done is aging aircraft and aging engines. And we have a skill set that I would put up against anywhere in the world for working on those platforms. But when you look at newer aircraft coming online, newer engines coming online, it's an entirely new technology. And it's going to require that we maintain that edge. We have in the Alamo Colleges and the Alamo Academies an unparalleled entry level. But I see the folks from Hallmark University here. And what we need to be doing is we need to be making sure that we keep that edge and keep that edge on the new programs. And entities like Hallmark lead the way on that. The last thing is the power of the incumbency. Can you imagine somebody stepping up and leaving that facility in Washington State? When you get to a size, there is such a thing in industry as being too big to fail. And we need to make sure that whatever industry it is, whether it's aerospace or cyber or what have you, just can't afford to pick up and leave. The question is, why San Antonio? What makes us great? Well, we've got existing infrastructure that was built to do this. D. Howard built those orange hangars up at the airport. It's a world-class maintenance facility. Port of San Antonio was built to maintain heavy aircraft. 
and it's a world-class maintenance facility. But what we have is aging, and it's not always state-of-the-art. I'm looking at Adrian, who manages our properties for us and does a fantastic job. But our average age of building at Port San Antonio is significantly older than I am. We have a current workforce and pipeline. When Washington State was concerned about where Boeing was going to build the 737 MAX, they hired Accenture to go out and say, where's a competitor? Where else can this work be done? And when they looked at Texas, they said the only place in Texas that's a competitor with Washington State is San Antonio because of its workforce. But we need to keep and sharpen our edge. We've got about 10,000 people in this industry right now in this city who are world class on aging airframes and aging engines. But we cannot rest on our laurels. And we have an industry cluster including key leaders. Did you hear how much of the industry Boeing controls? We've got Boeing here. And something else, and I'm going to give you a spoiler alert, Richard and Renee, Will, I know cybersecurity is a key industry for you. Sitting in between you is the CFO of the company that is the leader in the cybersecurity industry. Right behind you is another key leader in the cybersecurity industry in Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. The only executives in either one of those companies that have any interest in San Antonio are sitting at these tables. So we need to bolster and expand the base that we have. The trends, and you heard them, so I'm not going to go through because I get my information from Brian just like everybody else. On the military side, there's less funding but steady demand. The Congress of the United States, in their ultimate wisdom, no offense, has budgeted about two-thirds of the estimated maintenance needs for the Air Force. But I don't think anybody has told the engines on the F-16 or the airframes on the C-130 that they can only incur two-thirds of the wear this year. There's modernization. The difference between an F-16 and an F-35 is night and day. The difference between a C-5A and a modified C-5M is night and day. The emphasis on the military, bottom line, is going to be skills, value, and efficiency. And in a second, I'm going to tell you why San Antonio fits that bill. On the commercial side, it's increased technology. When you look at a 707 or a 727, you see a bunch of steam gauges and you see three pilot positions. When you look at a 787, you see a bunch of television screens and you see two pilot positions. And one of them, arguably, isn't really a pilot, it's a systems engineer. You see airlines looking for nose-to-tail capability. One of the best things about this job, transitioning from being a lawyer to being in sales, is I get to talk to airlines every day. And they tell me this. They say, Jim, when we're looking to outsource our maintenance, when we're making those maintenance decisions, we will pay a premium if you can return that airplane to us ready to go. Because there's not many places on the planet that can do that. We can send the airplane to one facility and you can work on the airframe. And you can take the engines off and you can ship the engines by rail somewhere else in the world. And then when you're done, you gotta go paint the, engine, the airplane somewhere. But if you can find some place where you can do that all in one place, well that's worth a premium. So again, on the commercial side, it's skills, value, and efficiency. Now the part I used to care a lot more about when I was a lowly lawyer trying to find some way to make money is what's going on with these companies. Well, the first thing that's going on, and you hear this not just in aerospace, we heard it from some auto manufacturers yesterday, is shorten the supply chain. I was reading in Brian's magazine this week that when Boeing looked at the supply chain on the 787, they found out that there was an air conditioning component that was being manufactured in Washington State, shipped to Italy, modified in Italy, shipped back to Washington State for incorporation back into that airplane. 
you heard about it from Brian when he said MROs are moving into the manufacturing world. A repair station has always had the right, the legal right, to manufacture products, and it is advanced manufacturing. It makes a lot more sense to have whoever is manufacturing that back shop capability on the same footprint as where you're doing the work. The second thing that's going on is the OEM involvement in sustainment. Th this is something that's really interesting to see. The fact that we've got a Boeing operation on the property that is sustaining aircraft really is something relatively new. It's been since 1998, but the idea that you're going to get involved in sustainment is something new. Operational and organizational consolidation. I would have been a lot more excited about this when I was a lawyer, because this is a lot of mergers and acquisition activity, and it's a lot of billable hours. But it's going to continue. And what the companies are looking for is, where can I consolidate into? There is no point in having 15 operational sites in one country. So what we need to do is recognize that the companies have an emphasis on skills, value, and efficiency and make sure that we as a community are providing that. So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to build from strength, diversify within the industry, expand the cluster, and address the weakness. Easy, right? So what's our strength? We've got key industry players. At MRO Americas this year, which is the big conference of all the maintenance folks, you know who the bell of the ball was? Standard Era. There was no busier booth than Standard Era, and we've got them here. Lockheed Martin's engine head operations are headquartered in San Antonio. VT Aerospace has one of their largest global maintenance facilities here in San Antonio. And the Boeing Company has one of their largest maintenance facilities here in San Antonio. And on that last point, Jeff, I hope you don't mind me taking this opportunity, but we're very thrilled to say that Boeing has just signed a lease extending their presence in San Antonio for another 15 years. <laughs> what we need to do is make sure that we're supporting the footprint that we have here. Dan, as chairman of the Aerospace Committee, came up with an idea that I wish I came up with, which is make sure that we know what the capabilities are here locally. We were talking to one key employer, and they just stood up a shop here a couple years ago, two years ago, and they said, when we came to town, we hired a whole bunch of support operations, a whole bunch of vendors, a whole bunch of suppliers from outside, because we didn't know that that capability was in San Antonio. So for all y'all in here who are in the industry, you're going to be getting an email from Dan. If you do nothing else, send back your ratings, send back your capabilities, and let's make sure that when we're bidding on work here, we know who's here locally. There are gaps, and we need to fill those gaps. On workforce and pipeline, we've got a demonstrated ability to rise to the challenge. That's good. But you know what we've been doing that's absolutely wrong is cost. We say we are a low-cost place to do business, but you know why? Because we tout one thing, and that's we're a cheap labor force. Now let me tell you how Roland says this, because Roland, this is a beautiful analogy. He says there's two ways you can compete in the world. You can compete the way Walmart does, where you're stacking it deep and selling it cheap, or you can compete the way a Neiman Marcus does, or a Saks where you brag about your quality and you brag about your expense. But the way to be successful in life is to be a Dillard's or a Macy's, where you're providing high quality at a reasonably affordable price. And I think that's a beautiful analogy, and that's why Roland's the CEO. I'm not the CEO, so I'm going to say it the way I want to say it. The biggest mistake that this city is making in every single industry is touting ourselves as a low-cost place to do business. We're not. Our electric rates, middle of the pack. Residential, sure, we're low. Industrial, so whether it's cybersecurity or whether it's advanced manufacturing, 
middle of the pack. The cost to build a building, middle of the pack. The cost of land, middle of the pack. The cost of operating a major industrial facility, middle of the pack. What do we lead the nation on? Labor cost. And I think we make two mistakes when we do that. The first mistake, and I've heard this back when I was a lawyer and I hear it now, is that we play into this mindset that San Antonio doesn't do cutting edge work. Remember when Kelly was closed? The reason Kelly was closed because there was a perception, not necessarily a true perception, but that doesn't matter because perception is reality, a perception that this was the worst workforce anywhere in the DOD. And I see Juan nodding because you were on the task force. We're not. But when we go out there and we are saying either expressly or implicitly that we are a cheap labor force, we're saying that we don't have those skills. And there are companies that will not look at us, that will not consider putting those advanced operations here because of the perception that we're not up to the challenge. The second thing we do, and this is a point where I probably need to distance myself from the port because I get passionate about it, we're hurting the city. You want more direct flights out of San Antonio? Raise the average wage. Don't go telling the airlines that we have all these government people flying to DC, because they're flying government rate. And when you fly government rate, you sit and wait. That's just the way it is. You want more office buildings in San Antonio? Raise the wage. Bring more jobs here. We want more amenities for millennials? Raise the wage. Make it so that there's a market for it. The way other communities are doing this is something we need to learn from. And we'll talk about that in a second. So our weaknesses. First one, our historic competence here is aging airframes and aging engines. We have got to make sure that we're cutting edge. There's going to be less heavy maintenance. There's going to be more LRU, line replaceable unit, more component maintenance. We've got to be able to do it. We have capability gaps. We're missing some key elements. Paint, for example. There's no real commercial quality paint facility in San Antonio. If you maintain an aircraft here, you're painting it somewhere else. And painting it somewhere else means you're putting a $50,000 non-refundable deposit down and basing your maintenance schedule around that paint window. And our capabilities aren't always compatible. So how can we diversify? Small inputs will give us big results. First, we've got an excellent, outstanding sustainment base. But we need to diversify beyond just the wrench turning on the aircraft. Life cycle management, supplier management, engineering, and spoiler alert, cybersecurity. One of the biggest challenges on aircraft today, and you might have read about this in the news, is can somebody hack into the control system of an aircraft? You can either hack into the avionics or you can hack into the engine, theoretically, while that engine's in flight. Separate and apart from that, you know, we're talking a lot in this community about how can we expand our cybersecurity base. Well, once again, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, is it any surprise that the big cybersecurity contractors are the big Air Force contractors? Next thing that we need to do is increase our backshop capabilities or help our existing customers increase their backshop capabilities. Because aerospace maintenance is advanced manufacturing. And we need to close those nose to tail capability gaps. This is what I mean. Today, and this is dramatically oversimplified, we have three key capabilities in San Antonio. With the folks at GDC, world-class interior work. With several companies, world-class airframe sustainment. And between Standard Aero and Lockheed, we've got some real engine capabilities. These are just some of the things off the top of our head that we should be doing on airplanes that I'm not sure that we are doing on airplanes today. 
satellite communications, accessories, commercial paint, auxiliary power units, avionics and navigation, landing gear, and the big thing, making sure that there is some coordination between the engines. The airframes that we're getting in, by and large, don't have the same engines on them that we're capable of working on in San Antonio. Imagine what we could do if we could have, if our companies can go out to the airlines and say, you drop your 777 in here, we'll take the engines off and send them to the other side of town or the other side of the port, we'll repair that airplane and get it back to you in four months. It's a competitive advantage. Cluster expansion promotes growth, it's greater regional efficiency, diversification, and it makes the region attractive for future consolidations. This is actually what keeps me up at night. If we don't make this cluster too big to fail in San Antonio, if we don't expand beyond just doing the wrench turning, we are at real danger at some point in the next 10 to 15 years of being consolidated into another location. You look at AAR, one of the largest maintenance companies in the world, they just closed a facility in Louisiana to move that work elsewhere. And the reason they did that is they would rather invest in one facility than maintain two. In North Carolina, Spirit Aerosystems got $250 million. Brooklyn Aeroplex, $158 million. Flight Star got 27.5. Embraer mini jets got 55.1, and our friends up in Oklahoma will give you 10% of your wages for 10 years. Now, I'm going to be fair about all these because it's not all cash to the companies. The one that really excites me that I think we need to think about is Oklahoma. You know how you get that? You don't have to be aerospace. You pay three times the county wage, they'll give you 10% of your payroll for 10 years because they are investing in the types of jobs that move that community forward. The rest of them are infrastructure projects. Very little of that money actually went to the companies. What they're doing is they're building facilities. They're building the infrastructure. They're building the support structure. The companies then move into it. You know, we talked a little earlier about are we doing a mistake by trying to compete by low wages? I think we are. Doesn't it make more sense to say we're going to demand high wages, but if you're willing to pay good wages, if you're willing to move this community forward, well, we'll give you a building. Buildings are cheap, relatively cheap. What are we really trying to do? Make money off of real estate? or bring jobs to this community. It's a mindset switch, and frankly, it's something not just our community, but the state of Texas needs to be thinking about. It's hard to compete with $250 million. And by the way, you're probably asking how many jobs. Global Trans Park, about 1,000. Brooklyn, about 600. Rest of them all in the five, 600 range. And wages all in the 50 to $60,000 range. So how do we compete with that? Because Renee is going to grab me right after the meeting and say, I'm not giving you $500 million. I don't have it. Well, the first thing, and the folks in the room are going to like to hear this, we need to focus on expansion and retention first and recruitment second. We're not going to be able to afford to go out there and pay that kind of money to bring in every industry we want. We've got to target the types of employers that we want. And we have to invest in our community, which means infrastructure and education. Now, personally, I like the idea of subsidizing construction for good employers, because worst case, we got a building. Best case, we got a building and a bunch of jobs. So what's the bottom line? Well, at the danger of quoting Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress, there is a great big beautiful tomorrow out there. And we are lined up at the end of the runway, ready to take off. And if we are serious about this, if we are serious about attracting this industry, or frankly any other industry, we can be on the other side of the clouds real quick. But you know, I, I talk a lot. 
more than people want to listen to. Paco and Philip from our team put together something that I think is really exciting. And it's something that we are going to take around to show the rest of the country and the rest of the world some of the sights and sounds of San Antonio in this industry. And we're going to premiere it right now. And you're going to love it because the soundtrack, like me, is jazzy.